you know, I apologize for this delay, but um, what I say to you goes through quite a few pipes and plumbing, and I could almost say the plumbing exploded this morning, so to put it mildly. Um, I will start with a statement on uh, what happened in Belarus um, over the weekend. And I can tell you that the Secretary General is deeply concerned over the apparent forced landing of a passenger aircraft over Belarus on May 23rd and the subsequent detention of Mr. Raman Pratasevich, a Belarusian journalist who was on board. The Secretary General supports calls for a full, transparent and independent investigation into this disturbing incident and urges all relevant actors to cooperate with such an inquiry. The Secretary General also remains greatly concerned by the deteriorating human rights situation in Belarus in the aftermath of last August's presidential elections. He urges the Belarusian authorities to fully respect all of its international rights obligations, including in relation to the freedom of expression, assembly, and association. Um, and a couple of an update for you from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and I can tell you that uh, while we do expect a more formal statement, that the Secretary General is, of course, very saddened by the loss of life and the damages caused by the eruption of Mount uh, Nyerango near Goma in the DRC <coughs> on the 22nd of May. He expresses his deepest sympathies to the families of those who have been effect affected, as well as the government and the people of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We're, of course, concerned uh, that this disaster comes at a time of increased humanitarian needs in the region, fueled by insecurity and the current economic downturn. And our colleagues on the ground are telling us that 13 people have died following the, um, the eruption. Approximately 5,000 people have lost their homes. As you can imagine, these numbers are likely to change as more information comes in. After the eruption, most people fled either towards Sake in the north Kivu or across into, the, into Rwanda. Uh, the road between uh, Ruchuru and Goma is currently blocked. It's important to note that this is the main supply line for food into Goma. Power lines and water supplies were also damaged and cut off approximately uh, electricity and water for about half a million people. Our UN peacekeeping mission on the ground also remains on high alert. During the eruption, uh, several helicopter flights were organized by the mission, including with volcano specialists, to assess the trajectory of the lava. Information was shared um, by the mission with local authorities to guide them in emergency response efforts. The lava stream stopped near Muningi, about five kilometers northeast of Goma, and that's, thank God, short of the airport. The airport does remain closed, and this impacts, of course, the movement of staff, humanitarian staff, peacekeeping staff, NGO and government uh, workers, as well as supplies, and also impacts, obviously, evacuations. People who initially fled are gradually returning, but seismic activity continues to be reported. Um, since this, the alert was issued, uh, the UN on the ground has been in constant contact with provincial authorities, including the provincial, uh, but the protection of civilian office and the Goma Volcanic Observatory to provide advice and support. A rapid needs assessment is underway. Our humanitarian colleagues have set up a crisis cell in Goma to coordinate assessment and response. We along. Um, we, along with the rest of the humanitarian community in the area, are supporting the government-led response by providing water, shelter, health, and family reunification, as well as uh, whatever other priorities those who have been impacted need. We're also mobilizing additional supplies and support. The peacekeeping mission is ready to clear the main roads leading to Goma as soon as conditions allow. The eruption occurs at a time when humanitarian needs are already high and increasing in North Kivu province. 44% of the 5 million people internally displaced in the Democratic Republic of the Congo are in North Kivu. In addition, 3.2 million people in North Kivu, that's 33% of the population, is already severely food insecure. Uh, and I have a statement on the situation in Samoa. Uh, the Secretary General has been following the developments uh, since 9th April general elections in Samoa. 
He urges the leaders in Samoa to find solutions to the current political situation through dialogue in the best interest of the people and institutions of Samoa. The UN stands ready to provide support to Samoa if requested by the parties. And the Secretary General this morning uh, spoke by pre-recorded video message to the World Health Assembly. He noted how COVID-19 pandemic has brought a tsunami of suffering with more than 3.4 million lives lost, 500 million jobs gone, and trillions of dollars have been wiped from global balance sheets. He said that the most vulnerable are suffering the most, and he fears this is far from over. The Secretary General called on um, uh, called for coordinate action in global action in three areas. First, he underscored that the world must respond resolutely and in solidarity to stop the virus, calling for an urgent global plan of equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, tests, and treatments. Second, he said we must bolster primary health care systems and universal health coverage. And lastly, we must prepare for the next global emergency. We've shared his remarks with you. And uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., the Secretary General will convene a roundtable of 14 heads of states and governments and ministers, as well as leaders from, in the, from uh, in, uh, extractive industries and civil societies. He will look to identify concrete measures to transform the extractives industry to maximize contributions to sustainable development. As you know, extractive industries are at the center of some of the world's most pressing issues, including climate action, debt and fiscal space, taxes and illicit financial flows, but also poverty reduction, social inclusion, women's and indigenous rights, to name a few. Uh, you can watch the roundtable on our UN Web TV platform. A press release and a policy paper will be made available later today under embargo. And on Sunday, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed joined African women's heads of states and governments, present and former, at a meeting of the African Women Leaders Network, convened by former Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in support of the President of Tanzania. The, Secre the Deputy Secretary General committed the UN system to fully support T Tanzania and the continent. This Thursday, Ms. Mohammed will join virtual solidarity mission by the African Women's Leaders Networks to Mozambique. That virtual visit will include Sustainable Development Goals uh, activate Grassa Machel, the former, uh, former first um, lady of uh, Mozambique, uh, uh, Bineta Diop, the African Union's Commission Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security, Fumzile Mblabuk Nguka, the head of UN Women, and the mission will be accompanied by senior African women leaders and will engage with a wide range of women leaders and stakeholders in Mozambique. And this morning at a Security Council open meeting on the safety and security of UN peacekeepers, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, the head of peace operations, reminded council members that peacekeepers continue to operate in complex environment where they face an increasing number of attacks by hostile actors. He highlighted measures put in place that have contributed to progress, but added with a spike in fatalities this year, 15 to date. Mr. Lacroix said the Secretariat is planning a doubling up of its efforts on safety and security going forward. He called on member states to ensure adequate equipment for peacekeepers, military intelligence personnel, and military public information personnel. He asked for support to prevent the manufacturing of uh, improvised explosive devices, particularly in the Sahel region. Mr. Lacroix also appealed for the deployment of more female peacekeepers and for political and technical support to enjoy accountability for crimes against peacekeepers. The head of the Department of uh, Operations, um, um, excuse me, the head of the Department of uh, Operations, Atul Kare, as well as the head of the Department of Safety and Security, Gilles Michaud, also spoke at the briefing. Their remarks have been shared with you. A uh, quick update for you on the situation in Gaza from our colleagues at the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. They tell us that the ceasefire, according to them, has held since it went into effect on Friday. It is critical that all parties to the hostilities work to maintain it. Routine life is being restored throughout Gaza. Some of the main roads have been made passable, and the authorities are fixing damaged electrical lines, water, and wastewater networks. Today, the RS crossing is open for international humanitarian personnel. Regarding the Karim Shalom uh, crossing, which I was asked about, <coughs> no trucks containing humanitarian uh, goods have crossed into Gaza today. Uh, or commercial goods, we're told. Uh, Israeli authorities have given the UN a green light to use the crossing for the passage of humanitarian goods, 
but there seems to be a lack of clarity on the kind of goods that can cross at this point, though we are con in constant contact with the uh, relevant Israeli uh, authorities to try to clarify this. Meanwhile, Lynn Hastings, the humanitarian coordinator for the occupied Palestinian territory, spent two days, uh, spent the weekend in Gaza speaking with people who she said had endured unimaginable suffering over the 11 days of hostilities. In a statement, she said she met with several families that have been deeply impacted by the latest round of fighting. One message she heard repeatedly is that the people of Gaza are traumatized more than ever. The intense strikes were without pause. Too many homes were lost and loved ones gone. Many people told her they feel helpless and have no longer any hope. Uh, as a reminder, in the coming days, we expect a joint humanitarian appeal to be launched, uh, either likely Wednesday or Thursday. We'll have something here as well on that. And on Yemen, the Secretary General Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths, arrived in Riyadh today for consultations. In the coming few days, he's expected to meet with senior Yemeni officials, as well as with Saudi officials and diplomats. The visit is part of Mr. Griffiths' efforts in the pursuit of a plan to ease movement, restrictions on people and commodities to and from Yemen, to achieve a nationwide ceasefire and to commit the parties to the conflict, uh, to the resumption of the political process. Meanwhile, an effort to prevent devastating famine, the World Food Program is increasing the level of food assistance in Yemen's worst hunger spots, but the agency's ability to sustain the response at, uh, to the end of the year remains uncertain. Uh, to prevent a famine, WFP needs $1.9 billion this year. To date, they have received $1.24 billion, which uh, should make uh, their operations um, viable until the end of August, unless more money is received. To give you some context, nearly 50,000 people in Yemen are already in famine-like conditions, and 5 million people are in immediate danger, according to WFP. A child dies every 10 minutes of preventable diseases, such as diarrhea, malnutrition, or respiratory tract infections in Yemen. Responding to these acute needs, uh, WFP resumed monthly distributions to 350,000 people in 11 districts facing famine-like conditions back in February. Moving on to Afghanistan, we, along with our national and international NGOs in the country, reaffirm the commitment to stay and deliver humanitarian aid to millions of people in need. Over the past year of conflict, spiraling food insecurity and the impact of the virus have nearly doubled the number of people in need of humanitarian assistance from 9.4 million to, in January 2020 to 18.4 million in January 2021. Violence has continued across Afghanistan, characterized by high civilian casualties and the displacement of almost 100,000 people just this year. Despite these challenges, 3.7 million people have received aid in the first three months of 2021. Together with our humanitarian partners, we ask parties to the conflict to protect civilians, aid workers, and civilian infrastructure, including foods and schools and hospitals, in compliance with the international humanitarian law. We urge them to grant unimpeded access to ensure that aid workers and service providers can deliver assistance and services without interference. We also call on donors and the international community to urgently fund Afghanistan's humanitarian response plan, which requires $1.3 billion to help 15.7 million people. Only $167 million, that's 13% of funding, has arrived so far. And in South Sudan, uh, our humanitarian colleagues and their partners today strongly condemned what they say is yet another spate of senseless acts of violence against aid workers, with two separate attacks having taken place on May 21st. In the first incident, a South Sudanese doctor working for the International Rescue Committee was brutally killed in a health facility in Unity State. On the same day, uh, in the same state, a humanitarian convoy carrying 10 International Rescue Committee aid workers was shot at by gunmen on the outskirts of Gual village. Unfortunately, no one, for, excuse me, fortunately, no one was injured, uh, but these two attacks come just 10 days after another aid worker was killed in eastern Equatoria on 12th May. Aid workers in South Sudan are extremely alarmed by increased attacks, looting of humanitarian supplies, destruction and vandalization of infrastructure. This is happening particularly in Pibor and Jongle State, 
where more than 108,000 people are in hard-to-reach areas, are facing catastrophic levels of food insecurity. And we, of course, send our condolences to our colleagues at the International Rescue Committee. And across South Sudan, 7.2 million people, that's 60% of the population, are facing severe hunger. Together with humanitarian organizations, we need $1.7 billion to help 6.6 .6 million people in South Sudan through the year, 33% funded for that appeal. And in uh, Central African Republic, uh, we are told by our peacekeeping colleagues that 50 constituencies went to the polls to elect their representatives to the National Assembly over the weekend. Overall, uh, the election succeeded smoothly with only a few reports of incidents allegedly led by armed groups, uh, elements of the CPC. Voters in uh, Bakuma, Gadzi, were able to vote for the first time since 2020, thanks to the stronger presence of the National Defense and Security Forces. With support from UN peacekeepers, they, they secured the polls and the safety of civilians in compliance with the Integrated Electoral Election Security Plan. In addition, the multifaceted support provided by the UN and international counterparts. The process was monitored by domestic observers. Provisional results are expected between today and the 31st of May, while the proclamation of the final results uh, by the Constitutional Court is on June 28th. Last note, uh, we have some COVAC updates from a country you've been asking about, and that's Libya. Authorities are spending, uh, speeding up the national vaccination program. On the af uh, after the second shipment of nearly 120,000 doses of the COVAX-backed uh, vaccine arrived in the country last week. This is the second batch that will be used for priority groups. It will also be administered to people who've already gotten the first dose. According to the national plan, eligible migrants will also benefit from, from the vaccines, and that's good news. The UN team is working closely with national authorities to prepare, receive, and dispatch all of the COVID-19 vaccines. The UN Children's Fund supplied more than 70 refrigerators to boost cold chain capacity and is also providing isolation centers and triage facilities. WHO, for its part, is providing technical advice to health authorities as well as medicine, equipment, lab supplies. And in Chile, our team tells us that the country has received their second shipment of more than 600,000 doses of the COVAX-backed vaccine. And that was last week. The UN team continues to support the authorities. We're tackling the health, social, and economic impacts. Celia. Stefan, I have two questions. The first one is on the arrest of the Pilar journalist. Is the Secretary General planning to talk or to ask the President of Belarus to free the journalist? I think, it, 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 yes. I think contacts are being had at various levels. Uh, we would like to see him uh, released. Uh, about South Sudan, can't the mission there provide security to the head workers? Well, listen, the, the, the peacekeeping mission provides as much security as possible to our humanitarian uh, colleagues. Is it possible to have a peacekeeper outside of every health facility? Sadly not. Uh, it is also the responsibility of the local, of the government, uh, the local authorities to ensure the safety and security. Uh, but we do our utmost uh, to do what we can to protect civilians and of course to protect, um, uh, to protect humanitarian uh, colleagues. Um, but it, it, it the, the, you know, the, we talk about all these horrible things here, frankly, all, all the time. Uh, but one can only imagine the impact of, on, on a whole community when a doctor is killed. His, I mean, the tragedy of this individual being killed is, of course, huge for his, his family and his loved ones. But one can imagine the impact it has on a whole community when you start attacking health workers, attacking humanitarian workers. Um, it's, it's terror, right? It's a form of terrorism, and it needs to stop. Sorry. <laughs> yep. Uh, Toby. Thanks, Steph. Uh, we heard from Special, special Envoy uh, Shana Bergner today, and we're, we're appreciative for, uh, for her briefings. Uh, I just wanted to ask 
is she and her office's work, is that the totality of the Secretariat's diplomatic efforts right now with regard to Myanmar? Or is the Secretary General also continuing an independent line of diplomacy to uh, ameliorate and improve the situation? Thank you. Um, let me put it, sorry, let me put it, um, let me put, put it this way. Uh, the Secretary General is not operating separately from his special envoy, nor is the special envoy operating separately from the Secretary General. Um, the Secretary General will have contacts, and he's had in the past, in support of the special envoy's uh, mission and work. She is, she represents him. So whatever he does and whatever she does is really for the same, on the same goal and along the same, uh, the same strategy. Uh, James uh, Reinel. Um, thank you, Stefan. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, I can't see you, sadly, but I can hear you. Here I am. Ah, uh, there right you go. Um, listen, it sounds like you're really busy today, and there's a chance you don't know anything about what I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, it's about uh, the United Arab Emirates has offered or asked to host the COP28, that's the climate change conference, but it's a couple of years down the line in 2023. Um, do you know anything about that? Um, and if a government says we'd like to host it, is it like an automatic thing you say, thank you very much, and they host it, or does it have to go through some kind of process? Anything you have on this would be appreciated. Yeah, it's, it's a matter for the conference of parties to decide. So it's a member state decision as to who hosts uh, a COP. And I believe there's some sort of regional rotations, but in the end, it's the member states themselves uh, who, are, who, uh, who agree on that. Okay, listen, that's great. Can I just flag one more thing? You were talking before about South Sudan. Um, South Sudan is coming up to its uh, 10th anniversary of independence, July 14th. It's a little way down the line. I'm just wondering, before then, is there a chance we could get the UN special representative to South Sudan or somebody like that talking to us about, you know, where the country has gone over the last 10 years and where it could possibly go? It's, that sounds like a plan. Mr. We'll, ask, um, we'll, we'll ask Mr. Hasem, um, we'll ask Mr. Hasem to... Um, We'll ask Mr. Hasem to come to you uh, at the earliest possible, well, closer to that date. Anyway, consider it yeah, done. He would be great. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, he, he you. Would, he, okay. Uh, James, uh, no, sorry. Not everybody's named James. Uh, Mr. Abdelhamid. For the last two days, the Russian president again that the Al Aqsa Mosque, right in front of the Republic of Israel. Security forces. Are you aware of that? And why there was no mention of that? Why there was no statement? Isn't that violation of the kind of terms of the ceasefire also? Um, I, I sorry, I, I I could hear every other word, but I think I know what you were talking about. Uh, we did see uh, uh, some of the very disturbing images. Uh, that came out of uh, of what happened on on Al Aqsa Temple 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 Mount uh, area. It is very clear to us uh, that there should be no violence in that area. The religious sites uh, need to be respected, and that the status quo needs to be respected. Um, and my second question. Yes, go. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. On April thirtieth. The UN Committee on Elimination of All Forms of Racism and Racial Discrimination accepted the complaint submitted by Palestine in April 2018. Now, this committee is uh, entitled, and it will, I think, start uh, with an uh, uh, investigation of racial discrimination and racism uh, undertaken by the authorities in Israel. Are you aware of this, and what, what is your comment on No, I, I've, I'm not aware of the decision taken by that committee, uh, but I'll, we, can, we can look. Um, there was a state... Uh, 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 there was a question, uh, I think, typed in by one of your colleagues, whose mic is not open, about the passing of Mr. Juan, uh, Juan Longping, 
the person known as the father of uh, hybrid rice. Um, and I can tell you that we join uh, others from the UN system who have uh, expressed our, our condolences uh, to his family uh, and also honor the momentous work uh, that uh, Professor Juan uh, did throughout his life, uh, which helped billions and billions of people improve their food uh, security. And food security is an issue that remains on top of the global agenda, and we all should be honoring his work. Okay, unless there are any other questions, I will release you. And I apologize again for coming late. <laughs>